Hello? All right. Seems like I'm on. Um, so there's been a little bit of a name change. Um, the talk after this is about uh, uh, Spark. And we had a few other talks. So I'm going to um, talk mostly about how, how to abstract these pipelines, right? And, and a little bit less about the Spark stuff that I was going to talk about, since we'll hear more about that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's the deck and the code. And I'd like to thank, you know, Type Level and Any Scala for having us here. And there were two talks that really influenced um, what I've done here. There was a talk by uh, Rob on fixed point types and a talk by Runar on constraints and liberties. And so I'd like to just like thank them directly as well. So let's get started. Here's a simple pipeline, right? This is fairly typical of something you'd see initially, right? Um, there are a couple of things that we notice about what this does, right? So we see A to B. Can you see any of that? Or, well, so can you see the A and the B? Kind of? No? Shit. <laughs> In <laughs> that? All right, you can see that, though. All right, um, this is going to be interesting. Um, so we have A and B, and they're inside of a stream. So we have a computation inside of a stream, right? A and B are already abstracted here, right? How do we abstract things in Scala? We lift them into the type, right? So we have, so let me, let me try something since the colors aren't really working. Um, all right, so A and B, we have here. Um, we abstract them into the type in order to get, th that's what we do in Scala, right? But we still have the stream repeated, right? So we need to do, abstract that into the type as well. This is not gonna work out very well. And you still can't see that, right? You, you can see that? Okay, cool, all right. So we have the stream. And we want to abstract that as well. Because what if you wanted this to be lists or Spark data sets? Right? So we abstract that F into the type, just like the A and B. Right? Is this new to anybody? Any questions? This should be fairly familiar. Right? All right, so we're going to switch gears. We have our types pretty well abstracted here. Right? So next, we're going to look at some of the functions inside of here, right? After abstracting the f out, these two functions are the same. Like, if you name them the same thing, the compiler will complain to you and tell you that they're the same, right? So we can abstract that, too. All right, so we take the common parts of these functions and abstract them out into a new function that these other two call, right? And we keep the, the parts that are different. So that looks like this. Right. Computation and write, they keep their, their A and B type parameters. And this new function convert takes an F and a function and then gives you another F. All right. So I'm going to pause here and look at this function convert for a little bit. All right. This is really, really abstract. And and like Rob said in his fixed point talk, whenever I find something really, really abstract, I'm paraphrasing, I look in the library and go to search for it, right? Because chances are, I did not figure out some new fundamental property of mathematics. You know, someone else did a long time ago and they put it into a library, right? So this is where cats comes in. Um, cats functor has pretty much the exact same function that I abstracted out, except it's the curried version, that's all. Um, so what does this look like inside of our pipeline, right? So this comes in as an implicit parameter, right? So you have your f, and you have a, func a functor over your f. Um, note how we did that, how we abstracted that. 
we took an implementation detail of our class and we lifted it outside of the class. Right, so that function convert no longer exists as part of this pipeline. Right? It comes from outside. We've totally removed it from the definition. Um, this implies there's, there's some sort of direct relationship between abstraction and decoupling. Right? So the more abstract we get, the more decoupled our code becomes. The more decoupled our code becomes, the more composable it is. So that's what we're trying to drive toward. We're trying to find out how to take pipelines that we have, multiple of them, and compose them. Because if you only have one data pipeline, you're not going to be in business for very long. Right? There's another thing about this that I want to point out a little bit. We have this F, right? And we reuse this F. It's the same symbol, and we're reusing it. But this compiles, right? This is, this is something that people coming from more dynamic languages um, kind of stumble on, right? When we're programming in a typeful language, especially a typeful language with a, a, a fairly powerful type system, you're programming in two different spaces at once, right? There's the types, and there's the values, and they're totally separate. The compiler knows they're separate, which is why we can redefine symbols. Right? So one of those Fs is a type, and one of those Fs is a value representing a functor of that type. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. We're all following along. Great. Okay. So we're going to take this concept of abstracting things outside of our class and move it further and abstract the rest of this, rest of the implementation details outside of the class so that we can compose more things, right? And that looks like this. So we have, we took all of our functions that were part of that trait and created other traits representing those functions, right? And those functions are function ones. So these are composable, right? Because they're function ones, you just take one of them, dot compose the other one, or the one of them, dot and then the other one. So now what we have is, is an architecture that allows you to take, to take something like, uh, if you have two different pipelines that have the same inputs, right? But you compute different things on them, you don't need to make two entirely separate pipelines to compose these two things together. You need one read and two computation and writes, right? Instead of rewriting that read or passing in one of the pipelines into the other one, right? So we're, we're wholly decoupled here. And that allows us to compose more things, right? So that's what we get out of this, out of all this work that we're doing. This is still not, this still doesn't feel right, right? So we, have, so we have this apply function, and the apply takes our input, which is a URI, you know, this is coming in from some web service or whatever, and um, it also takes all of the parts of a pipeline and runs that pipeline. So we don't have separate pipelines, really. We have one meta pipeline, right, that combines all these things and runs. What we would like is to be able to define concrete pipelines, multiple of them, and then, oh no, that's not good. Oh, we're back. <laughs> so we're going to take multiple of them and combine them. Um, right. So we're going to pull out this apply definition. Right. We turn pipeline into a sealed trait. Right and it's abstract. And then we make our object pipeline define our apply method. Right? This does a few things. Right? We can encode multiple pipelines this way that are concrete, that we can later compose. Right? And this also opens the door to more constructors. And it gives us more control over those constructors. So, once we're done building our data pipeline library, our client code gets simpler. 
And that's, that's the whole point of all this abstraction, is client code getting simpler, right? Also, more constructors are, are important for composition because they, they allow you to find more ways in which you can compose these different things, right? Okay. So, for instance, this is how we would compose multiple pipelines in a sort of switching mechanism, right? We have our input, and based on that input, we need to, def we need to decide how we're going to, to um, run a result, right? So here we're using an if and an else if chain, right? There are a couple of things that I don't really like about this approach. The first is there's a lot of boilerplate, right? All of this is boilerplate. I've grayed out the rest. There are these constants here that are muddling up the picture, right? And the logic is, is actually the smallest part of this implementation, right? So how do we get just the logic in the client code? How do we like lift the logic like directly into your face, right? So what we're aiming for is something that looks like this, you know, five lines of code from this, right? Okay. So the first thing we need to recognize is that for each pipeline, we have a guard with a constant, right? So what we want to do is just like how we abstracted everything else before, we want to lift this into our type system. We want to model guards with constants into our type system, right? So let's do it. All right. So we define a new trait. We call it guard, and all it does is return a string, right? It just has one string in it, that's all it does. All right. And then we, we add this type parameter into our pipeline trait and into our pipeline constructor. So pipelines have a guard, which is a constant string, right? The problem with this is, is um, let's see, back here, right? The last case returns an empty stream because that makes sense here. We know we have a stream, right? So we know what to return in the case where our input matches none of our pipelines, right? Here we don't know. We have no idea what F is, right? So this goes back to, to um, Runar's talk, right? We have liberated our types, so we have constrained our implementations. So what we need to do is the opposite. We need to find some type that we can constrain here so that we can liberate an implementation detail, right? Okay, any questions? No, okay. So what we're going to do is constrain our output type. And we're gonna do this in the type system as well. Just like all the other abstractions that we use, we lift it into the type system. Right? So our pipeline type no longer returns an f of unit. It just returns whatever you want it to, right? Here. So this, is, this part is sort of counterintuitive because I said I wanted to constrain this, but this is way more liberal, right? But if we look at our constructor, we constrain the output type in our constructor to an either, right? So now that we have this either, we know we have a left and a right. Yeah. So we return a right if it matches, and a left if it doesn't match, all right? Okay, so let's see how that looks in the client code, right? So we need to, on the left side, we define some phantom types, you know, just some traits to, to shove guards around. Um, and then we make our guards, and we make our pipelines. This looks way worse, right? <laughs> this looks awful this nested either approach, right? Our client code sucks, it really does. 
But this buys us a lot of things, right? We, what we, what we see here, right? We have a statically known list of pipelines, right? And what we're converting that into is a recursive tree whose leaves are potential results, right? So also we have in the implementation of this function a sort of type hourglass shape, right? So the first thing we could potentially return is an either of either of either, right? The second thing is we go one step into that and we have an either of either. The third thing, we step into that, we have an either, and then inside of that, we just have unit, right? And then this fans back out into either of either of either, right? So we have this weird hourglass. Um, just, from, just from experience, from writing code in Scala, um, writing functional code in any language, really, um, typically, when you see this hourglass in your types, when you run a function, you normally have something somewhere where you can you can apply induction, right? You can apply induction because you have some nesting. So that's what we're going to try to do. So we need to know a couple of things about that, right? And this is where shapeless comes in. So the first thing we're going to look at is uh, shapeless has a, a um, type called hlist, right? It's a heterogeneous list. This differs from a regular list in that lists, in that regular lists do not um, hold type information. So if you, have a, if you have a list and you have an int, a char, and a double, right, you get a list of any vowel. Whereas if you have an h list of, with an int, a char, and a double, you get an h list of int, char, double, right? So it, retain, it retains type information. So this is something that we can use to sort of model our, um, our no, statically known list of pipelines, right? So the second thing that we're gonna use from Shapeless is coproduct, right? Coproduct is the categorical dual of a product. It means any of these things. So instead of having an int, a char, and a double, it's an int, or a char, or a double, right? Okay. And we also need to know how to perform induction, right? So we'll do a little short thing about that, right? Induction, all it is is you take a base case, you apply an inductive step, you apply that inductive step again, and you get a result. That's all you do, that's induction. Okay, so now, what does this look like when we apply this in our type system to our pipelines, right? Induction in Scala is performed with implicits. Okay, so we get this, right? The first new thing here is the aux type, right? So this is a shorthand for a type refinement, right? So that we don't have to write type out equals whatever every time we build a new pipeline, right? Because we have to define our out type in our pipeline nowadays, right? Okay, the second thing that we do um, is have a base case, right? Which we call, which we're gonna just call PNIL for the nil for pipelines. This is just your basic Pipeline that does nothing, right? It returns unit immediately. Okay, yeah. So there? Okay, yep. So, all right. So, like I was saying, we have our um, base case, right? PNIL, which is just empty, basically. And then we have our inductive step, right? Where we take a head and a tail, and we combine them into one pipeline, right? 
which is a co-product, because it's any of these things. It's not all of these things, right? So we take all of the pipelines, and we generate something which gives us any of the pipelines. All right. Uh, okay. So this is what we have now. This is arguably better. Very hard to argue that, right? We have all of these type annotations. They're, they're brutal here. Um, so this is, this is where I got to. And um, this was a failing of basically my inexperience, right? I've only been writing Scala for, for three years. And I've only been doing functional programming in Scala for like two and a half. And so I, I don't know that much, you know? And I get to this point, and I'm like, how do I get rid of these type annotations, right? How do I get this to be like just a simple operator, you know? Um, so, so I looked at a couple of, uh, of ways. So I tried to go with induction, right? Implicit induction. But this required a lot of work um, and a lot of knowledge, right? There are some concepts here that, uh, that, that are pretty high levels, right? So for implicit induction, the solution that I came up with needed hlist, it needed view bounds, it needed is h cons, and it required a huge spike in compilation time. You know, um, so I don't work in a vacuum, I work on a team. And I started talking to members of my team, and um, I started asking them what they were comfortable with, you know, different concepts in Scala that they were comfortable with using in our library, right? And um, the simplest solution, right, that totally escaped me <laughs> was just use an implicit any val, right? And encode the operator on that, right? And all that requires is an implicit conversion, which is pretty simple, and an operator, which is just a def, which is pretty simple, right? So what this looks like is a class called ops, right? And what this does is it, it takes an implicit, it implicitly wraps the tail of our pipeline, right? And then has, a, has an operator, which you call on the head of our pipeline, right? So we go tail first here. This is because we wanted this operator to be more natural, right? So the first pipeline would be all the way to the left, and the last one would be all the way to the right. And in Scala, the way you do that is defining an operator with a colon as the last character, right? Okay. Okay, so you guys see that, All right? So with this, we get this final thing, right? We get exactly what we needed, right? We have pipeline one, operator, pipeline two, operator, pipeline three, operator, nil, All right? This is, so this is our client code. This is pretty much as simple as it gets, right? And what this does is, is it constructs a pipeline which tries the first, then tries the second, then tries the third. If it doesn't find anything, it just returns unit, right? So there are a couple of considerations here, right, that I have. Um, so we made p nil a def instead of a val, right? It doesn't take any arguments. Why did we make it a def? Um, the, the implicit conversion would not work when it was a val. Um, so when I found this out, well, it, I mean, I found out the hard way because it wouldn't compile. Um, uh, I, I had no idea what was going on, right? And I was randomly trying things to get it to work because I, I, I figured, Mathematically, like, it, this, this works, it definitely does, right? Um, and then one of the random things I tried was changing it to a def. And it, it, just, it just magically compiled after that, right? Um, I'm not sure why, 
the inferencer <laughs> just could not infer the, the proper type when it was a vowel. Um, but it could when it was a def. Um, maybe my best guess is that, is that when it's a def, it unifies the types at the call site rather than, rather than defining this type elsewhere and then trying to unify later. But I, I'm not sure. Um, the second consideration is that this does not work with Spark datasets, right? The reason this does not work with Spark datasets is because Spark datasets, their type requires a, a um, context bound with encoder, right? So you can't define a cat's functor over Spark dataset because cat's functor doesn't have context bounds. We can get around that problem, right? Um, and the way you do that is you just define your own bounded functor, right? So bounded functor takes two higher kind of types, right? It takes f, which is your functor type, and b, which is your bound type. And now map can have its view bounds, right? And then, right, so we just do the bounded functor. So we can define a sort of hack of the normal functor using a different cat's type called ID. All ID does is wrap around the same type and return it, right? So ID of A is A, but it's a higher kinded version of A. So it's, it's sort of a, a way around this limitation of the, of the type system, right? So once we do that, we can define our, um, our spark functor this way. And then all other functors that we had before still work using this. You don't have to change any of your previous code, right? So we got it working with Spark, right? And um, so yeah, that's, um, that's about it. So you take the first thing we did, right, was abstract our types out. That gave us composability. And then we abstracted our functions, you know, very similar functions. We combined them into more abstract versions of, of those functions, right? Then we found similar things in, in libraries that we could use, because using libraries is way better than using your, uh, your own inbuilt stuff, because chances are the libraries are better anyway. You know? Then we lift all of the independent parts of our um, class into, well, outside of the class, right? So that we can compose them more easily, and we can compose them more independently, right? Then we use implicits for our in induction, and um, if needed, you know, we needed it here, we can roll our own um, type classes, but that should be reserved, you know, only for special cases, right? Yeah, um, and that's all I got. Do we have uh, any questions? It's, it is a bunch of nested coproducts. So, um, so we use shapeless coproduct to combine those things. It, so, so the difference between coproduct and either is just coproduct has a lot of other functionality built on top of it that helps you um, uh, navigate that tree at compile time. You know? So um, that's why we use coproducts at that level. Um, at the bottom level, though, we used either. Um, the reason for that is just because I like fold on either. Um, and coproduct doesn't really have, you, you got to do pattern matching, and I'm not really a fan of pattern matching. Yeah. It would, 
Um, and I did run it on the type level compiler, and the compile time was like way reduced. It, it was crazy. It, you can't even compare them, really. You know, I tried to run um, some benchmarks on it, but, but it's, it's just so wildly different. Um, but we don't use that um, in production uh, just because it's just one other thing, you know. It's one more library, one more, one more thing I would have to, you know, introduce to the team and go over and figure out with everybody else and, you know. <laughs> what would get you less, less um, So time, that's the only real thing. Um, I have, so I work on a, on a small team of Scala developers that are not Scala developers, right? I'm the only Scala developer on the team. Um, we have a Python developer and a Java developer um, also. So introducing another thing um, on top of HList and co-product is, is a little much right now. Um, but, in, but in time, that'll be easier, you know? Yeah. All the way in the back. Um, wait, actually, um, yeah, so, yeah, I think I, w <laughs> so, um, yeah, yep, so, so, I, I, here I do it as a, as a context bound on F, you know, um, but in another, in a different slide, I did bring it in as a, an implicit parameter, but, yeah. but, I mean, they're, they're identical, except the name when you do it this way is evidence dollar sign one instead of, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, there's a place in the cache code base right now that has a comment. For some reason, if we change this from a depth to a valid stop working, don't change it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, I, I do make it an applicative. Um, in a 30-minute talk, uh, getting that far was, would be rough. Um, but yeah, I, I've done that, but I, I didn't know that, that you could take an applicative and sequence it into an H-list. That's interesting. Yeah, that's new. Oh, um, yeah, it's, it's just so that it's, so we call that apply function somewhere, right? So um, we just need, we just need it around to call it. That's it. Yeah. So it's, it's, just a, it's just an abstract function on the trait, and we do call it eventually. Yeah. We could have just extended function one, um, but this way, you don't get the, um, the inheritance from function one, right? So your pipeline code, the byte code is actually smaller. So it runs a little bit faster. That's all, yeah. All right, uh, that's all the time we have. So let's give another round of applause to Marcus.